A few days after the last race of the 1984 season, Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was assassinated by her own security detail. Two Sikhs, who had initially been removed from her guard during the operations against Sikh separatists that culminated in the Amritsar Temple massacre earlier in the year. Keen to emphasise she was not anti-Sikh in general, she pressed for their reinstatement, which turned out to be a fatal mistake. In the aftermath of the assassination, a wave of anti-Sikh pogroms took place, at least some of which seem to have been organised by the ruling Indian National Congress Party. In four days of violence, anywhere between three and 17,000 Sikhs lost their lives and many more were displaced. As if India hadn't had enough to deal with, in early December, a leak from a chemicals factory in Bhopal, in Madhya Pradesh, released huge quantities of methyl isocyanate gas into the surrounding area, exposing some half a million people to the extremely toxic substance, resulting in thousands of deaths. The precise number remains unknown, with 3,787 cases having been settled by the plant's owners, Union Carbide International, but some 16,000 claimed by campaigners. Even the lower figure is well over double the death toll of the next deadliest industrial disaster in history, and says nothing of the hundreds of thousands of injured, blinded and otherwise disabled victims. It wasn't until 2010 that seven Union Carbide employees were convicted of negligence and sentenced to the maximum possible under Indian law, two years in prison and a $2,000 fine each. In November, the US presidential election took place, resulting in a landslide victory by Ronald Reagan, who won 49 states, with his opponent Walter Mondale only carrying his home state of Minnesota, and that by just 3,761 votes, and the District of Columbia. Reagan's storming win, with 59% of the popular vote, echoed that of Nixon's drubbing of George McGovern, with 61% of the popular vote, in 1971. A few days before Christmas, four teenagers boarded a subway train in New York and were shot and wounded by electric store owner Bernie Getz, who claimed he was acting in self-defence after they tried to rob him. Against the background of increasing crime and fear of crime in New York, and particularly on the subway, some hailed Getz as a hero, standing up for himself where the police were unable or unwilling. Others believed the four teenagers, who claimed that they had just been asking for change to play video games, and that he had attacked them without provocation. The subway vigilante case, as it was known, would dominate headlines throughout the winter period, and partially inspired the 2019 film Joker. It wasn't all doom and gloom, though. Twelve years of military dictatorship ended in Uruguay with the election of Julio Maria Sanguinetti in November, and 21 years of military dictatorship in Brazil ended with the election of Tancredo Neves in January. The first Hackers Conference was held in California after the publication of Stephen Levy's influential book Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution. In January, the domain name system was launched for naming computers on a network, and in March Richard Stallman, an attendee at the conference, published his GNU Manifesto, outlining his vision of open-source computing for the future. Konstantin Chernyenko died after just a year and a bit in charge of the Soviet Union and was succeeded by the comparatively young and vigorous Mikhail Gorbachev. Long-running soap operas EastEnders and Neighbours began in the UK and Australia respectively. And the border between Gibraltar and Spain was opened for the first time since the dictatorship of General Franco, with Ken Tyrrell out of the picture, the Foker teams were able to argue successfully not only against a further restriction of fuel tank size, but to actually get an increase from 220 to 240 litres for the 1985 season, which would certainly please the Alfa Romeo team and their customers. In a trade-off, cooling the fuel before filling the tank was also banned, and while new rules were being made, FISA also banned the little winglets that had been sprouting on the side of rear wing assemblies. Other than that, things in 1985 would be much as they had been, the Tyrrell team were reinstated once the rule changes had gone through, and although ATS had disappeared, there were three new teams entering the ring in the shape of Minardi, Zaxpeed and Haas, though only the first of these was planning to enter the whole season. The calendar, as announced in January 1985, saw the Dallas race move to the start of the season, though that was soon cancelled as the promoter had absconded with most of the money from the 1984 race. Other than that, the Portuguese and South African Grand Prix had swapped places, with Portugal now kicking off the European season, and South Africa closing out the year. There was another, and probably final, attempt to organise a New York Grand Prix in September, which would come before the first Championship Australian Grand Prix. And finally, the FIA introduced a new junior formula to act as the final step before F1. Formula 3000 would replace Formula 2, which had seen dwindling grids in recent years as the cost of competing with the dominant Honda Works engines was becoming prohibitive. 
The new Formula 3000, named after the maximum 3000cc engine capacity, would see a mixture of old F1 chassis, the Williams FW08C, the Tyrrell 012 and the Arrows A6, and purpose-built cars from Rout, March, AGS and Lola, all powered by the good old Ford Cosworth DFV series. The calendar for the new series was planned to coincide with F1 as often as possible and run as support races, giving the F1 crowds a chance to see the stars of the future in action. After a season of dominance, McLaren are very much not fixing what ain't broke, with most major elements remaining the same as in 1984. The MP42 chassis has got some cleaned up aerodynamics to comply with the new winglet ban, and the Porsche engineers tweaked the tag engine for better power and fuel consumption. The only major change was the switch from Michelin to Goodyear tyres following the French company's withdrawal from the sport, which in turn required a bit of rejigging of the suspension. Nicky Lauda had won his third title not necessarily by being faster than Prost, in fact over a single lap Alain was often quicker, but by using his experience and patience. Often he used qualifying more as an opportunity to tweak the car, lining up down the order and then carving his way up through the field in the early laps, then settling in and waiting for the others to fall by the wayside. He could still put in a scorcher when he needed to, but he didn't feel he needed to as often as others might. There had been questions about his motivation before the season, and Nicky the Rat had provided a convincing answer. Prost looked happier at McLaren in 1984 than he ever had at Renault in 1983, even when he was pipped to the title yet again. Alain and Nicky brought out the best in each other and never clashed like Prost had with Arnoux. Prost's mechanical sympathy was a dream for his crew, his smooth, undemonstrative driving style that was earning him the nickname Le Professeur suited the car, and really, it was only a bit of bad luck that had denied him the title. Can 1985 finally be his year? Readmitted to Foca and the championship after the new fuel regs had gone through, a deal had been struck whereby the team would be awarded travel expenses based on where they would have finished if not disqualified, and as an olive branch, Bernie Eccleston leaned on the previously reluctant Renault team to supply turbo engines, which would both allow the team to remain competitive in 1985 and perhaps stop Ken bellyaching and restore some harmony to the paddock. In any case, the engines wouldn't fit the current 012 chassis, and development had stopped on the new 014 following the disqualification and subsequent loss of sponsor and TV money. So Tyrrell Technical Director Maurice Philippe and Chief Director Brian Lyles got back to work and hoped to have the new combination ready as soon as possible. On driving duties, Martin Brundle and Stefan Beloff both returned, keen to prove that their good showing in 1984 had been a result of their own talents, not an illegal car. Stefan Beloff might have grabbed the headlines with his heroics in Monaco, but Brundle had equally impressed with his speed and smooth style, in contrast to the Rosberg-style scruff of the neck driving the German favoured. Scoring points on his debut, and second in Detroit before his accident in Dallas, Brundle was very impressive throughout 1984 until his crash, and will hope that he can quickly regain that form. He and his supporters will also hope that he has suffered no lasting physical or psychological issues from his two spectacular accidents. Alongside Ayrton Senna, Stefan Beloff was the big news story of 1984, often qualifying badly but then putting in a rocket start and flinging the car around the track in an entertaining manner. He was a joy to watch, especially in the wet at Monaco, and had little respect for big star names, but perhaps his raggedy edge style led to a few more accidents than Brundle. He didn't seem to be overly impacted by switching between F1 and sports car racing, and won the WEC title in 1984, before deciding to concentrate on single-seater racing in 1985, though he would drive the odd sports car race when the opportunity presented itself. The Williams team had slipped back since its championship winning days. They came late to the Turbo Club in 1983, and then their 84 chassis had failed to effectively translate the power of the Honda V6 into speed. Sure, they still won races, because sitting in the number 6 car was a man who could wring its neck and force it to go fast, apparently by sheer willpower, and who would always give 100%. Sadly, the occupants of the number 5 car, Derek Daly and Jacques Lafitte, had been disappointing in comparison, usually happy just to tootle round in midfield. However, the team were positive about 1985. The new FW10, their first entirely carbon fibre chassis, was looking good, both in terms of its testing times and its smart new navy white and yellow livery. In Nigel Mansell, meanwhile, they hoped for a more combative second driver who would score points more often than his predecessors. Although most felt he didn't have the speed and natural talent of his teammate Elio De Angelis, Mansell had improved immeasurably during his four years with Lotus and had turned heads with a series of combative drives in 1984, finally given a car he could do well in. He still has some rough edges to knock off, 
but he should be a good match for Rosberg, both are combative, brave drivers who don't give up. Mansell had a habit of driving as Lotus to bits, but the Williams seemed tougher if Rosberg's driving was anything to go by, so he might fit right in. It will certainly be a make-or-break year for the Englishman. The team leader retained his number 6 billing and simply hoped the car would be a bit better this year. He had been vocal in his criticisms of the FW09, but he also recognised that everyone was doing their best and he simply got in and did what he could with it. And what he could was usually very good indeed. Even in Portugal, he was there muscling into the lead like he was fighting for the title rather than languishing eighth in the table. And his win in Dallas was, like Monaco the previous year, a result of his tenacity, his superb qualifying performances and his cool head in trying circumstances. The BT53 had been the only car that looked in the same league as the McLarens in 1984, and PK had dominated qualifying with nine poles out of 16 races, only to inevitably blow a turbo and retire during the race. For 1985, Gordon Murray has produced the BT54, moving the winglets from the rear wing to the back of the side pods, and generally keeping with the theme of keeping the weight balance towards the rear to give added traction to the driving wheels. Joining PK on driving duties is Francois Eno a surprise signing from Ligier, and not an Italian for once. The new car looks good, and has been having rigorous shakedowns, but it is still effectively a one-car team, and they may lack the strength and depth to challenge for the Constructors' title, even if PK is back in the hunt for the driver's crown again. One interesting thing to look for will be the tyres. Brabham went with Pirelli to replace their Michelins, while McLaren went for Goodyear. How much difference will this make? Nelson PK begins his seventh season with the team, and more than ever, Gordon Murray's car and Bernie Eccleston's team are built around his requirements. If the frustrations of another flop of a title defence got to him, he didn't show it, appearing relaxed and jovial all season, even cracking a smile when he ran out of petrol on the last corner to lose second place at the European Grand Prix. However, PK was usually the only serious competitor to the McLarens, and even when things just weren't working for him, he had the maturity to wait it out, take what he could get and hope for better luck next time. If confirmation were needed that Brabham are essentially a one-car team at this point, the appointment of Francois Hainaut as Piquet's number two was it. The young Frenchman had had a better year at Ligier than many expected when he appeared out of the blue, and he often ran the more experienced de Cesaris close, though usually only later on when de Cesaris had largely lost his motivation. He didn't do anything wrong exactly, but he didn't turn any heads either, and there were many other drivers struggling at smaller teams who would have leapt at the chance to drive the Brabham. No one expects much of Francois at Brabham, but maybe that lack of pressure will help him. Cutting all ties with the March organisation hadn't helped Ram any in 1984, and neither had increased sponsorship and turbo engines. Skull Bandit, the chewing tobacco people, turned a few heads by agreeing to continue sponsoring the team in 1985. Many had expected them to fold after yet another dreadful season, and the team could actually look forward to better times. Testing seemed to indicate the new Ram 03 chassis was actually quite good. It was penned by Gustav Brunner with Dave Kelly out on his ear. Coming along with Gustav Brunner was his old ATS buddy Manfred Winkelhock, himself no slouch in the driving department, to partner Philippe Alio. Having stuck with the ATS through thick and thin, and there was considerably more thin, the popular West German driver's reserves of patience and good humour turned out not to be infinite after all. The season started so brightly with the BMW engine providing bags of grunt. Winkelhock usually qualified well and turned a few heads with a fine run in Belgium, but the chaotic and bizarre management at ATS, the daft decision to run two cars while barely coping with one and as a final straw being pushed off the formation lap with a broken gearbox twice in three races, cracked the cheerful veneer and caused an acrimonious split, with Winkelhock showing up with lawyers in tow at the next round to ensure he got paid. A drive in the second Brabham in Portugal put him in the shop window and gave him a chance to show what he could do. Alio's less than stellar record in junior formulae led most to predict that he would be absolutely blown away by the more experienced Jonathan Palmer in 1984. In the event, he held his own, though he was usually the slower of the two, just not by as big a margin as everyone thought. As nominal team leader, he got the new car first, which was something of a poison chalice, and although he spent most of the season as a mobile chicane, it was hardly his fault and the car was simply so awful it's really difficult to assess Alio's ability. He'll be hoping the new 03 chassis is kinder to him and that he's able to make the most of it. The illustrious Heffelbase team had rattled a few cages with their capture towards the end of the season of Brazilian wonder kid Ayrton Senna, who would partner Elio De Angelis now in his sixth year with the team. The new car, the 97T, features some of Lotus's signature innovative thinking. As well as moving the winglets from the rear wing to the side pod, as Gordon Murray had at Brabham, 
Additional pieces of carbon fibre nicknamed barge boards attached to the chassis between the front wheel and side pod assisted with the flow of air over the car. Early signs looked good, the 97T was quick right out of the box and set some impressive testing times with Senna at the wheel. De Angelis looked second best so far, but he'd been third in the 1984 driver standings largely on the basis of his consistency, and if the car was reliable, the combination of the two could have a very good year indeed. It seems harsh to say that Elio, who had his best season yet in terms of position, could and should have done better in 1984. He looked lively early on, took his first pole position at Rio, and could even have won but for a bit of a mechanical bad luck. He was never quite as good again, apparently deciding early on that the car just wasn't quite good enough, and simply cruising to a series of points finishes. In a different season where fewer of his competitors had reliability problems, he would probably have ended up well down the order, and he took third almost by default. All that said, De Angelis did show increased maturity in 1984 and put in some gutsy drives when in previous years he might have just given up. There was still a petulant streak, as shown by his stupid blocking of Mansell in Montreal, but for once he genuinely outperformed his teammate and earned his place on merit, not on the basis of sponsorship. How he will react to Senna will be interesting to see. The mercurial Brazilian had grabbed the lion's share of the headlines in 1984 with a series of fine drives, most notably of course in Monaco, and he became a regular top 10 starter and simply blew his more experienced teammate Johnny Chicotto into the weeds. He came across as driven, intense and often difficult to get on with, but in the cockpit he simply oozed quality. Raw talent doesn't mean the finished article of course, and Senna sometimes made mistakes, but more often than not it was the car, not him, that failed though the physical effort seemed sometimes too much for him, having to be helped from the car on two occasions. The circumstances of his move to Lotus may not have been ideal, but it's clear that if this man is given a decent car, he can go places. He just has to hope that the 97T is that car. <laughs>